All right, and good morning, or afternoon, or evening, wherever this finds you. I had a bit of an oops with the last recording on section 5.1 on integrals. I was not aware that the sound wasn't working. Uh, so here we can plainly see now that it's working. I'm going to quick give a uh, maybe 15 minute talk on integrals. So sorry for the inconvenience, but this is what we're gonna this is what we're, what we're gonna have. So integrals. Um, this is chapter five. Integrals are these things which, uh, in a sense, are the inverse or the opposite of a derivative. We've talked in section 4.9 about antiderivatives. Uh, and so if I gave you some function and I asked you, which function do you take the derivative of to get that one? We call that function the antiderivative. So if you go from right to left here on this board, you start with this capital F function, you take its derivative, you get this guy. Then what that means is this is an antiderivative of that. The process of going in reverse is finding the antiderivative, and this is going to be essentially computing some integral at a later point in time. So we're going to talk about what the idea of an integral uh, is, um, and we're going to get into in future sections how this is all related to derivatives. <clears throat> but for now, I need to talk about the idea of area approximation. If I drew any old shape on the board, and I asked you to tell me the area of that shape, uh, I presume you would not know a specific formula to give me that, that area. And so you'd have to result, resort to using some sort of other method. Uh, and a common method to use would be <coughs> to use areas which you do know the area for. For example, you know the area of a square is x squared. You know the area of a triangle is one half base times height. You know the area of a rectangle is base times height. Uh, you know the areas of lots of things. Circles might come up at some point. Right, so you have this big long list of areas which you do know formulas for. And so there's this idea that if I give you any shape here, you can approximate it by using these guys and just adding up all the different shapes that you put into there. For example, if I want to approximate this using just, using just squares, then I could make a grid-like pattern on this shape. where I'm restricting myself, just making squares as well as I can. And if I continue to tile this shape on the inside of it, I can underestimate the actual area by just adding up the area of all of these. And if I want a closer approximation, I just add more squares in. And they can become as small as I want. But the benefit of this is I can know the area of every little square, because I know the formula for that. And it's really not that difficult to just add up all the numbers that I get in here. But this is an underestimate, because all of my squares are contained within my shape, right? What if I instead chose some squares to be outside of my shape? Say, for example, I start drawing squares like this. And some of them are grossly outside of the shape, others not so grossly outside of the shape. But I've overestimated on every single square. 
that would also work pretty well, but at some point I would need to come back and remove some of these because I know I know that I've added too much in here. So the red squares would still be an overestimation, but they would be an estimation of the area of the shape if I were to tile the whole thing like this. And the blue is that under approximation of the area. And this is one of the fundamental ideas of what an integral is going to do. You can imagine this curve as being something on the xy plane. And so I have perhaps some rule which gives me the pieces of this black curve, say this top portion of it. Um, and so then that rule would tell me the y coordinate if I gave it some x coordinate. So instead of working with something that's so complicated, let's look at something that's much simpler. So I'll start with this function f of x equals x squared, and I'm curious what the area is below it from 0 to 1. So the area under f of x equals x squared, and above the x-axis, between x equals 0 and 1. So this isn't um, terribly difficult to, to imagine with this sort of thing in mind, but we perhaps want to restrict ourselves to sort of a class of squares or a class of rectangles that have one thing in common to make things a little bit easier. Because this function tells us the height, right? Um, and the height is going to be changing. It'd be really nice if we restricted ourselves to using rectangles which are this tall, but all have the exact same width. So that the, the process of computing this area is always just the height function times the constant width and then we can just add up a bunch of these rectangles. So let's first look at an under approximation, and I'm going to use, <clears throat> I'll use 4 with my approximation, I'll use only 4 rectangles. First, we want to sort of compute how wide will each rectangle be. So we take our length of our interval from 0 to 1, which is 1 in length. We divide that into four pieces, and we plainly get that our rectangles will be exactly one-fourth wide. One-fourth unit wide. So now we have some options. We can underestimate our, our area, and we can overestimate our area. To overestimate our area, I'll go ahead and use red again like I did up here, we're going to be choosing for this function the right hand endpoint of each subinterval, that is our partition of the interval 0 to 1. So I'm going to take 1 fourth and I'm going to use the height of the curve at that point as the height of the rectangle we will use to estimate this area. So I've got this red rectangle, which is our approximation of the area underneath the curve. In this interval, I'm going to use, again, the right endpoint, so the height of our function at 1 half. And this rectangle is going to be that rectangle which approximates this area underneath the curve. And I do this for each interval we have here, so we get this. So these four rectangles, perhaps I'll shade them like this, alternating. These are the rectangles which we are going to 
find the areas of and add together so that we can find an over approximation of the area underneath this curve between the x-axis uh, and the curve and between also 0 and 1 for x. Yeah? So let's, let's do that computation. So the area of this first rectangle is going to be the width 1 fourth times the height. Well, the height is 1 fourth squared. The second one is also 1 fourth wide, and it is how tall, right? We plugged in 1 half, and the height is then squaring that. And then 1 fourth for the width of the next rectangle, and 3 fourths is what we plugged in to find the height, and then 1 fourth times 1 squared. We plugged in 1 to get the height of this rectangle. So this is the area of this small rectangle, this is the area of that next rectangle, this one the area of that rectangle, and this one the area of this rectangle. We add all these guys up and we've got ourselves an approximation uh, and over approximation of our area. But we could make this more precise, right? This, we could make it closer and closer and closer to the actual area by using more and more and more rectangles. And that's the idea that we had up here. We can use more and more and more squares to approximate the area, but in this case the squares all changed in, in their widths, right, to do that. Here we're going to always be using width, rectangles of the same width. So as we use more rectangles, now the widths get smaller. And so if we look at some over approximations with like, for example, eight rectangles, this right rectangle is now cut in half, and then we end up with these two rectangles to replace it. And we notice this red top corner is entirely removed. And if we do this for each of these, cut it exactly in half, using those right endpoints again. Now we notice with eight, eight rectangles all of equal width, we've taken off this and this and this and this area, which were grossly overestimating the original area. So by using more and more of these guys, uh, we can more closely approximate the actual area we're looking for. A very simple way of writing down things like this is using this notation called sigma notation. This is a sigma letter from another alphabet, not English, and uh, what, we're, what it represents is the adding up of a bunch of things. So first we're going to write down what we're adding up, and here I'm just going to write the word rule. We're going to give this rule some starting location some starting number, and then we're going to say that the things that we're going to add up are what you get when you plug in the starting location, the starting number, into the rule, and then continue to plug in the next, num the next integer, so plug in 1 to the rule, then plug in 2 to the rule, then plug in 3 to the rule, 
so forth and so on, up to some final count, and you add all of those things up. So sigma notation gives you some starting number to plug in to your rule, some ending number to plug in to a rule, and it means plug in all the numbers from this to that, integer numbers, and add them all up. So what would our rule up there be? We notice that all of these were 1 over 4 times something. So the rule for the sum up there is 1 fourth times something squared, right? And what was that something squared? It was n over 4 squared. If I rewrite this one half, it becomes more apparent. And if I rewrite one, it becomes very apparent. That all we did up there was, starting with n equals one, we plugged in one here, squared it, multiplied by one fourth. That gives us that. Then we plug in the next integer up, which is two. And we plug it in here, right? Gives us two fourths. We square that, multiply by one fourth. Then we plug in the next integer up, 3. We get 3 fourths squared times 1 fourth. Then we plug in the next integer up, which is 4, and that's our last value that we're going to plug in. And we add all of those things up. So this is our sum above. Okay. And this is the right hand endpoint method that we used when we're starting here at this one instead of starting somewhere else. We're picking the right hand uh, endpoint of each interval that we've got here between 0 and 1. Sometimes this is called the right sum or the right endpoint sum or the right endpoint approximation. Okay, um, a good question would be how does this change as we introduce more and more rectangles. So here, this is a 1 fourth because we picked 4 rectangles. And this was n over 4 because we picked 4 rectangles. And this is a 4 because we picked 4 rectangles. If we picked any number of rectangles, how does this change? <clears throat> so we're still going to start at 1, choosing that right end point. And then we're going to go up to, let's say, some big number, so some capital N number. So between 0 and 1 then, how wide will each rectangle be? It'll be exactly 1 over the capital N. What we plug in is still going to be this little N, but now it's going to be divided by capital N, and then squared. So this is no longer what we have here. This is a more general situation where you get to arbitrarily pick how many rectangles you are going to divide the interval 0 to 1 up to, uh, and then you plug in the right end point of each of those intervals to your function to get the height. You multiply by the width, and this is an over approximation. Still, it's an over approximation, but it's an over approximation formula for any number of uniformly wide, of uniform width rectangles. which makes this a really nice tool to have. And again, all it means is starting with n equals 1, you're just going to add up what you get for this rule when you plug in 1, and then 2, and then 3, all the way up to whatever this number is. If it's 8, well then this is 1 eighth times n over 8. So you'd plug in 
1 here, and you get 1 8 times 1 8 squared, plus 1 8 times 2 8 squared, plus 1 8 times 3 8 squared, and that's what you would have for the blue area that I've drawn over here, where we're adding up 8 rectangles to approximate that area. Okay? And this is a little bit different than an under approximation. which we can get by taking the left end points. So if I'm still concerned with finding that area, and say I want to use just four rectangles, then I again divide my interval into four uniformly wide pieces. So we've got one-fourth here, two-fourths here, three-fourths here. Our formula is pretty much the exact same. We're going to plug in something squared, or something into the square, we're going to multiply by the uniform width of each of these rectangles, which is one-fourth, and then we're going to add them all up. The key difference is what our initial height is. So if we want to under-approximate this curve, we can choose, like we did up here with the blue, we can choose things that are always underneath the curve. It just so happened that before choosing the right-hand interval, the right-hand endpoint of our intervals, gave us an over-approximation, and it happens this time that choosing the left-hand end point of our interval gives us an under-approximation. So if each of these intervals, in each of these little intervals, I pick the left side to plug in, the first rectangle we get is actually a rectangle of zero height. The second rectangle is this tall. It goes over like this. The next rectangle is, for this interval, we pick the left end point, we go up, right, and we get this rectangle. And then the last rectangle, here's our last interval, we pick the left end point, is that. So these four rectangles, one with zero height, one with the height at the left hand end point of this interval, and so forth and so on, this is an under-approximation of the area underneath. But we can make this better by creating more and more and more rectangles, just like before, splitting these guys in half. It doesn't change the fact that this first one is still zero in height but this next one is now a little higher, and then all of these are a little bit closer now to the area we're trying to get. So now it's drawn for eight rectangles. So my question is, how does it change over here in the formulas? I've got a little bit of space over here that I'll use. So we still have this sum, but let's go to the at least the first few terms of this eight, um, eight rectangle piece. So the width of each is one eighth. The height we plug in is zero out of eight first. That gives us our zero height for that first rectangle. Then we're going to add the area of the next rectangle. It's this one right here, which has a left end point in the interval of one eighth. So we plug that in. The next one is the interval 1 fourth to 3 eighths, so we plug in the left end point, which is 1 fourth. Another way of writing that is 2 eighths, and we would keep going for all eight pieces. Now notice how similar this is to this. We're taking the width, 1 over n, and we're multiplying by some n divided by the width size or the number of rectangle count, but we're not starting in the same place. We're starting at zero instead of starting at one. So this sum we could very easily write as so n equals zero. The end, if we think about real quick what this last interval 
looks like. It's 7 eighths to 1. The height we're going to plug in, the value we're going to plug in to get this height is the left end point, so 7 eighths. So the end value is going to be 7. The width of each of these is 1 eighth, and what we plug in is n over 8 squared. So this is the sum of all of these blue rectangles now. Notice how we just shifted this, and it very neatly gave us the left hand, uh, the left end point sum, which is an under approximation in this case of this function. Both approximate the area underneath the curve, and with both of them, if we let n be some crazy large number, then both of them can very, very accurately approximate the area underneath the curve. And that's essentially what we're getting at is we're, we're trying to integrate, we're trying to compute this entire area with arbitrary precision, which is what will happen as we take the limit of these sums later on down the road. But for now, what we're doing is using some number of rectangles with the same width, and we're using them to approximate areas either using left-hand endpoints or right-hand endpoints of the subintervals that we create. And that will give us some over or under approximation. That, in a nutshell, is what we're doing in section 5.1, um, where we're computing these approximate areas. So uh, I think that right there is all we covered in class. And I hope that you had sound for this. I think we have sound running for this. So. Um, if you have questions, shoot me an email. If not, I'll see you in class. Okay? Until then, have a great time.